Hello everybody, it's good to see you again today. We're going to do something a little bit different because today we're talking about speech anxiety. And I like to think of that actually a little bit more broadly even as communication anxiety. So likely, if you decided to take this class, you're not completely terrified of public speaking. You generally don't decide on your own to do things that are completely uh, immobilizing to you. But chances are good that you do still experience some types of communication anxiety. For me, that communication anxiety centers around conversations, so interpersonal relationships with people who have different relative power levels. So talking to my boss, that's really intimidating to me. That's something that, that causes me a lot of communication anxiety. As I'm sure you already know, you can't go through life without talking to your boss sometimes, at least not if you want to be able to pay your bills. And that means that I have to be able to overcome that communication anxiety. Now this, talking to you in person or on video chat, that doesn't bother me. But there are communication situations where I do experience anxiety. And so I want to talk to you about some of the ways that I have learned and that research has taught me to be able to overcome communication anxiety. So your textbook talked about several today, and I want to begin by focusing on the ideas of your body first. So let's think a little bit about that. Your textbook talks about ways of thinking, particular ways of thinking that oftentimes uh, can trigger communication anxiety for you. So obviously you wrote a little bit about those and you talked about those a little bit today in your uh, quiz. But there are more ways than that because that anxiety actually goes deeper. It's not just your conscious ways of thinking that can get in the way of your communication or that can cause you anxiety. There are actually physical chemicals in your brain that cause your anxiety. We're going to watch a video today in our learning communities about the lizard brain. Yeah, I know. That's what I thought the first time too. But what it actually means it's actually referred to as your amygdala. Right down at the base of your skull, very well protected, is a little bundle of nerves and neurons and other brain stuff that I don't know about because I got a degree in the humanities, not the sciences. But that little bundle and cluster gives off chemicals, specifically the chemicals that control two functions in your body. The systems that gear you up, your anxiety systems that would help you fight or flee if you were in danger, and the systems that control your unconscious body. So your resting, respiration, or your breathing, your digestion. And those two different systems are called the lizard brain because every creature that has a brain of any sort has those two chemical systems. Something to motivate them to get away from fearful stimuli, and to tell them when it's safe to do those more relaxing processes like processing food, digestion, or building relationships. Now for people who are afraid of public speaking, that lizard brain doesn't know the difference. That is your lizard brain does not know the difference between being afraid of public speaking and being afraid because a bear is chasing you. Now think about that for a minute. If your anxiety is getting in the way, it's not your fault, you're not a bad person, it's that there are chemicals in your brain telling you there's a bear. And the bear is going to get you if you stand up in front of that audience. And so what we need to do is begin to help our brain with all of the rest of our neural systems. We need to help our lizard brain recognize that we are actually in our own homes. We are actually in a fairly safe location. We are actually in a speaking event and there are no bears. So that's what we're going to do today. I know usually you probably sit and watch the lectures or listen to them and take notes, but I want you to stop that for a minute today. Set your computer or your phone or whatever you're using to watch this down in some place where you can see it and stand up. I'll wait. Take a minute and get up on your two feet because we're going to start the same place our anxiety starts with our bodies. Okay? We're going to do some physical activities that are going to trigger your lizard brain into that rest 
respiration and digestion or calmness side of your body. So first things first, think a little bit about your feet. They're a long way down there, right? And compared to the rest of you, they're fairly small. But your feet have a huge number of bones, muscles, tendons, and nerves because they do something interesting. Your feet hold up a skyscraper, right? The rest of our uh, animals on this planet, especially mammals, tend to have a much more firm base of operations than we do, but not us. No, we are the giant skyscraper model of mammals. And that all rests on our two feet, which we tend not to think about very much, right? And so think a little bit about how you contact the floor. When you're standing normally, are you leaning on one foot more than the other? Are you moving one foot off the floor and the other? Clog dancing a little bit. What exactly are you doing with your feet? Start by putting your feet nice and flat on the floor. And then the next thing, if you are an American, that you are likely to do is lock your knees. Let me show you that just for a minute. You might put your feet nicely and flatly on the floor but then you are likely to take these lovely bendable, flexible uh, joints in the middle of your leg and push them backwards, right? My legs now bend this way. Obviously they can bend that way a little bit, but you know what that does? That locks me into resting on my tendons. So instead of the bones, you know, the skeleton that actually has the strength to hold me up, I have instead passed all of my upper body weight onto my tendons. Any of you who've played soccer or who have uh, played sports that require running or using your knees a lot, you know that it's probably a bad idea for your tendons to get hurt or stressed or strained or God forbid, broken or ripped, right? And so what I want you to do is think about your feet, get them nice and flat on the floor and then bend your knees. Don't lock them, don't lock one to lean on the other, but keep your knees bent. You should, at any point in time while speaking, be able to bend your knees without unlocking them. The way you can tell that, you'll be able to see this in your videos, is if your head bounces. If your head is bouncing up and down, chances are good, if it's doing it without the rest of your body moving, that that's because you're locking and unlocking your knees. The next thing to think about is your hips. Americans like to stick our hips out forward. I don't know why, but we tend to lock our knees, which brings our hips forward. Then we're all off balance, and so we lean forward like this. Great posture, right? My walker and I. But here's the thing, you don't have to do that. You, in fact, have more brain than just your lizard brain. You can make a different choice, and that's what I want you to do today. So start with your feet firmly on the floor. Bend your knees, then get your hips over your feet. It may feel like you're sticking your backside out. Trust me, you're not. You're just bending your knees and changing your posture. And that brings us to the last important thing. This amazing pole that runs up and down your back. Your spine is a truly amazing contraption. It holds the very most important part of the you that is you up on top of this giant skyscraper. It keeps you upright, but flexible. It lets you bend and move. It lets you isolate particular movements and it keeps your head safe. It allows you to look around and in fact, see that there are no predators. And so think about that big, beautiful spine that holds up the entirety of you. Give it a little bit of grace. Think it a little bit, yes, I'm serious, for how much it does to hold your body upright. So we have started at our feet. Our knees are not locked. Our hips are back and over our nice springy knees and firm feet. Our spine is holding us upright and our head is stably placed at the top where we can look around, have control, have charge of our environment and tell our lizard brain that we in fact do not see any bears. So that's the first step. 
your body is now physically ready to do any kind of presenting that you'd want to do. You can move around. If you're the sort of person who likes to pace and move a little bit, you can do that from this posture. If you prefer to stand behind a lectern to have a little bit more stability or stableness or, or lack of movement in your presentation, you can do that from this posture. But from your brain's perspective, what you're doing is telling it your body is safe. You're not stuck where you need to freeze so the bear doesn't see you. You're not running, leaning forward trying to shift your body weight to try to get away from the bear. You are instead stable. The next thing to think about is your breathing. You're in a private space right now. You can close doors, go somewhere where people aren't watching you, or just remember that those are people who care about you, and you'll be fine. I want you to do something for me. Make your belly big. Yes, big. Make your belly big by breathing in. Fill your stomach up with air. We usually breathe from right about here. Our lungs, our shoulders, and really only the top parts of our lungs. Thing is, that type of breathing does nothing to tell your body anything. That's just everyday breathing. If it increases from your your body's going to think that you're lacking oxygen. That's a scary thing. Your lizard brain is gonna jump right back in and take control. Instead, let's try to trigger that other system, our rest, relax system. Remember one of the things I said that system does? Digestion. And so one of the things you're going to do is use the muscle called your diaphragm. It's connected here at the bottom of your rib cage. Feel where your rib cage is. There's a diaphragm right under there. Anyone who's ever played a wind instrument, a uh, woodwind, or who's uh, ever been a singer, you're going to know about this muscle. Use it now to push your organs, your reproductive, or not your reproductive organs, although they're down there too, but your digestive organs. All of those intestines that turn food into things your body needs. Push them down and fill your body up. You're there. That type of breathing triggers your lizard brain that you're not in danger. And so one of the things you're going to do before you speak, before you stand up to give your speech, if you're feeling anxiety of any kind, is make sure your physical body is in a calm, but stable stance and take a couple minutes for breathing. Now, this will change the way you speak. So get yourself used to it by practicing today. It might feel a little silly at first. That's fine. You don't have to do this where people are watching you. This is not something where you have to stand up in front of, say, a video camera with lots of students watching you that you're going to then upload on YouTube where anybody could see it. Hmm. No, this is just for you. Get your body in a stable position and use that relaxing breathing. So today you're going to take a little bit of time. You're going to work on those physical things to help you with your breathing and your movement and maybe some communication anxiety. And I can't wait to see what you do as you're speaking today. Thanks, everybody.